Welcome everyone to Private Cities in the Developing World, Has Their Time Come? Hosted by the Penn Institute for Urban Research. My name is Eugenie Birch and I'm co-director of the Institute with Susan Wachter. The issue of private cities in the developing world is a pressing one. And I'm very excited for this conversation, looking at great examples from around the world and their implications on urban policy. I'd like to introduce one of Penn IUR's faculty fellows and superb researchers, moderator for this event, Gilles Durantin. Gilles is the Dean's Chair and Real Estate Professor at the Wharton School. His research focuses on urban and regional development, transportation, and local public finance. Prior to joining the Real Estate Department in 2012, Gilles taught at the University of Toronto for seven years and the London School of Economics for nine years. He is co-editor of the Journal of Urban Economics and a, an editorial board member for several other journals. Welcome, Gilles. Thank you very much, Jeannie, for this kind introduction. So cities are complicated objects where the public and the private tend to interact a lot and they're deeply intertwined. The traditional model is nonetheless one where governments, central or local, make the important decisions and implement them either for the most part or delegate the implementation to private firms. Other models are nonetheless possible. This is what this recent World Bank report is doing for us. This report was edited and in large part authored by Martin Rama and Ueli. You can find the full report in the link in the chat. This report aims to show that this, there are alternatives to these traditional, well, to these to these traditional well, models, and that private actors can fruitfully play a more important role. The challenge is, of course, to identify the circumstances under which this is more likely to happen. So let me tell you briefly about the authors. Martin Rama is a consultant for the Equitable Growth Finance and Institution Vice President at the World Bank. Before that, he served as chief economist for Latin America and Caribbean region, and before that, for the South Asia region. Uh, previously, he was director for the World Development Report in 2013 on jobs. This is actually when I met him and first worked with him on UA. And before that, he occupied a variety of research and operational jobs at the World Bank, which took him to many parts of the world, such as Vietnam. He gained his degrees first in Uruguay, and then his PhD in France in 1985. UA, UA Lee is a senior economist at the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. She's been on second man there since 2021 and will soon return to the World Bank, where she previously worked as a senior economist, among others for Martin at the Office of the Chief Economist for South Asia and in the Global Investment Climate Unit. Her research covers a lot of ground, ranging from international economics, firm dynamics, economic geography, and urban economics. She holds a PhD in economics from Rutgers University, and previously she was at Syracuse University and before that, Peking University. So thank you, thank you very much. Martin and UA, this is your turn. Thank you very much, uh, Dini, and thank you, Jill, uh, for this, I'm not sure where the image is coming up, yes, um, for the, this very kind introduction. Um, I'm very pleased to, to be, although virtually only, with you uh, today, uh, and I hope uh, there will be interest in the academic community around the private cities, uh, around urban issues on, on this presentation. This is a research that the UA and I started a long time ago when we were both working on South Asia, the Chief Economist Office for South Asia at the World Bank. Uh, and their private cities became a reality that we were not expecting. In a way, we were trained to think, as Jill described, as cities uh, being coordinated uh, by governments, essentially local governments, of course, households, firms, making decisions, but on a broader planning uh, an infrastructure layout and zoning that was coming from government and, and representative institutions. And what we came across in a very blatant way uh, was that uh, the aspirational place for the middle class in India next to Delhi was an entire city that was not had not developed that way. That was by then the, had the third uh, highest income per capita 
in India that was home to half of the Fortune 500 companies uh, headquarters in India that had a privately built metro uh, and where, by the way, half of our office at the World Bank was living there. So we started looking at this uh, and we realized that there was much more than this India outlier out there. Next slide, please. Uh, and, and that's what we describe in uh, this book. It's on open access, so you can download it and uh, there are uh, our contacts. But let us, uh, for, for 20 minutes, let you and I tell you a bit more about the, the contents and, and the hope that that will uh, stimulate you. Next slide, please. So first, the motivation for this report. Next slide, as I said, uh, we have come across multiple studies in which, by the way, Jill was uh, involved in several opportunities across developing regions where uh, it was very clear that there were problems with urbanization. Uh, there was under-urbanization, there was excess primacy, there was underperformance. There were variations of these in different parts of, of the world, like uh, self-selection, very strong self-selection in Latin America, consumer cities and living out of rents of natural resources in Africa. Uh, but there was something that was common to all of these cases is that there was a weak uh, capacity of local governments to steer the urbanization process. And one may argue that urbanization is the most important transformation, perhaps even more than the sectoral transformation that developing countries go through. And so failing on this has very important implications. The, the low capacity took many forms. Uh, one was a technical capacity, one was a more institutional, uh, land is essential to urban development and property rights, land regulations, cadastral records are, are very incomplete and weak and fragmentary. And then there were uh, organizational issues, like who is responsible for the city, uh, which take two extremes in the case of South Asia, where mayors, which are among the most important characters in, in Western economies, are almost symbolic fig figures because you have multiple departments of different line ministries dealing with the cities and facing humongous coordination problems. Next slide. Uh, so the flip side of that, and that's a part that we found we had not seen so much in, in academic research, was that there were private cities like the one I described, Gurgaon, you know, next to, to Delhi. Uh, and so we started getting interested in these entities, these un unconventional entities, that we defined by two main characteristics. One is they had to be a major urban area. We were not talking here about gated communities. We all know those exist everywhere. Not about mega slums, and not about industrial parks, business improvement districts, but the whole urban structure that connects people and jobs firms and households. And the second is that a non-government actor, a significant non-government actor, uh, was playing a role that was traditionally uh, associated with the government. Uh, could be a large developer, that's the most obvious uh, example, but we find business associations, civil society organizations, even governments from other countries uh, lead the urbanization process in a specific country. Next slide. Now, when you look at it in perspective, that's not totally new. We're used to this model where the uh, entrepreneurial spatial coordinator is the government, but in the history of urbanization, it was not that way. And so there are many examples, medieval Paris, you, you know the logo with the boat, and that's because the boatsman guild was the one running the city. Florence, a spectacular city, was the city of the Medici. Uh, there were the company towns in the industrial revolution, the edge cities uh, of the uh, late 20th century. Um, and even now, there are very big developments associated with, uh, I would say, with forms of nimbism, with the fact that it's not like governments have low technical capacity, but they are a bit paralyzed in what they do in terms of uh, urban development. The three pictures you have there are big examples from Washington, D.C., where the headquarters of the World Bank are, are located. We all tend to think of Washington, D.C. as 
a city with an urban planning from the French Enlightenment uh, with these diagonals and avenues. But it turns out that a big part and a very dynamic part of the city where the new Amazon campus is and uh, where a lot of the technology uh, dynamism of Washington DC are private cities too. Next slide. Now, we started looking in, in more detail and there were 14 cities, major uh, private cities with this definition that we studied in more detail and UA will be telling what is that we learned from them. Uh, here is the, the map with the location of the ones uh, we looked at. And what we found is that they were across countries with different income levels, uh, in countries with different cultural traditions, with different political systems. And so the conclusion from that is that it's not a particular uh, organization of society that is delivering this. It's the fact that there are untapped urbanization needs. And when the, the price for delivering a city is huge, some arrangement will, will appear. Next slide. So just a word, we chose private cities. This is not a term we uh, invented ourselves. It had been used, although not in too much detail. The idea that uh, a large firm could do exactly the same thing as a local government, if the scale is large enough, you can find it in public economics back to Stiglitz in 1977. What we tried to bring was this apparent contradiction in terms between cities, which is almost one of the foundations of how we live in society, and private. Uh, which is almost uh, the opposite. So it's a way to attract attention to what seems like a, a contradiction in terms. Next slide. So what does the book do? First, it has a simple analytical model to try to organize what we see in practice. I will be saying a few words about it, but I will not go into much detail. Uh, then there are four country level inventories of private cities. We wanted to know how many of these entities uh, there are. Uh, so we looked at Egypt, India, Indonesia, and Pakistan, uh, and we tried to use the analytical model to classify what we saw. And finally, there is something like a meta-analysis of these 14 private cities where we look in detail using the same structure, who was the private actor, how it interacted with local government, uh, how land was assembled, and so on and so forth. Next slide. Let me say a few words, but just a few words about the analytical model. Next slide. Here, what we try to do is to blend two analytical traditions. One is in urban economics, where there are articles uh, that see, there are important articles that see the city as a result of an entrepreneurial spatial coordinator that is attracting firms and workers in a way that maximizes uh, some local surplus. Uh, and some of them in particular were very pleased that we built on, on papers by Professor Hesley, uh, who basically these papers uh, by him served as the foundation on the urban economic side. But we also looked at the political science side, where uh, unlike urban economics, where uh, these private actors are not very well known or perceived, in the political science, they are all over the place because uh, political science is about the role of power and the influence of these non-government entities usually seen as an oversized and uh, even illegitimate influence but there's quite a lot of analysis on that and so we reconcile the two by considering a, as a game a political economy game where there are two players who can develop urban land I will not go into the details of the moment, but let me tell you the intuition. What makes you sure that uh, the city will not be the best city is that the interest, uh, the, what they are doing is not aligned with the public interest. In the case of the government, it's not that we don't assume that uh, the government is not well-meaning. It's just that it doesn't have the technical capacity. And again, this doesn't mean that it's made of uh, dumb people. It means that there are all sorts of constraints that prevent uh, being at the frontier on what needs to be done, technical or institution. Uh, the other player has the capacity. Uh, some of these, as you will see in the, in, the, in the part of the presentation by UA, some of these players are quite extraordinary, but their objective is not to maximize the well-being of the population, to maximize the rent they can extract. So their objectives are not aligned. 
and you put them together in a game uh, theoretical setting. And these imperfections or these misalignments may uh, amplify each other, may offset each other, and that brings new nuances. Uh, next slide. So this is the part I will not describe. You, we, you can skip, next slide. And this one we can skip to. Uh, let me just focus on this. When you have this kind of game, um, each of the players may decide to develop land. Land is the instrument they have. They develop urban land, they convert agricultural land into urban land where firms can settle, households can live. Uh, each of them can do it uh, or not do it. And so you may have uh, situations like the cell that you see as company town where only the private actor uh, develops land and the local government doesn't do it. Or you may have the opposite, uh, the conventional city where it's all, only the local government that uh, develops land and not the private actor, or none of them may develop land. So we start with the assumption that the place can urbanize and generate a surplus, and still it may remain rural completely. And then you have cases in which both develop land. And here, how the, the game is played is important because they can be reactive to each other, they play simultaneously, uh, and that may add to the mess. Or one of them may be strategic, may be proactive, may lock in the development by uh, developing urban land. Uh, and there, the case that is interesting in the model, uh, another case is a bit, is when the government says, OK, let, I will use my land development strategically to uh, crowd in a private actors. So these are the categories we have and that we follow through our country inventories and uh, our analysis. Next slide. Uh, you will skip this one, it's technical. Just let me uh, review some of the interesting or, or more unexpected implications model. You say the model is so simple, the conclusions are always implicit in the assumptions. What we want from a model is to get a bit of a surprise. So here is one bit of a surprise. The first one is that what we are trying to do as development practitioners in, in developing countries is to increase local government capacity so that urbanization process better. And that works after some threshold on government capacity. What happens is that low levels of government capacity is that you increase the capacity of the local government, it develops more urban land, but in a poor way, it crowds out a more efficient private developer. And so it's not guaranteed that you are getting better results. And that's disturbing because in developing capacity, we are talking about decades. So that's one first question. Second, a temptation that you may find more from the political science is why not to ban the private actor? Uh, just let the government do. But that's not necessarily welfare improving. You, you could get a place remaining rural where it could have been at least a company town. The, the welfare economic approach is to say, let's align the incentives of players. Instead of the government developing land, what the government should do is to incentivize with taxes and subsidies so that the private actor does the right thing. And that's the way we think about other economic problems. Uh, we, we are used to the idea of governments producing cities, not to government producing clothes. Uh, we think, oh, if there is a market imperfection, they will deal with it in, in another way. Now, this works, but it turns out that you need to subsidize in the model substantially the private actor. Uh, so what we find is that the result is not pilot efficient, other people are worse off. So in order to get through that way to something that is both efficient and equitable, you then have to tax and redistribute a lot. And one may wonder whether governments that cannot develop urban land have the capacity to do this with very significant players in countries with weak governments. And the final interesting option is, what if instead of going the, 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 the welfare approach, you go uh, the, the property rights approach? And basically, you sell the rights to the city. You, in, in some circumstances, you basically do an agreement uh, with a private developer on those specific terms that may resemble a PPP and you will get back to that. And we have found that some of our examples of our 14 cities were built that way. Uh, next, and then I turn to you here. Thanks, Martin. Uh, in what follows, in what follows, I will talk about our uh, key findings from the meta-analysis of the 14 cities. Next one, please. Before doing that, uh, we just want to mention like 
uh, the uh, inventories that we did for the four countries, uh, Egypt, India, and Indonesia, and Pakistan. And for the reason we want to show this is um, to show that indeed, um, when we de define private cities as a, a major urban agglomeration with at least one significant private actor of uh, 2.5 square kilometers uh, in terms of area and with mixed land use, we find uh, numbers of them uh, in all four countries. Of course, um, the total number and their characteristics uh, vary across the four countries, but it's verified. Uh, they're not just, uh, you know, the 14 uh, examples that we picked, but more, uh, you know, a progressive uh, than, than the, a selective case. Secondly, as you can see um, by the different color of the bar charts, um, the topology that we derive from the simple analytical model also applied in um, all four countries. Some of them uh, some of the cases that we found fall into the company towns. That uh, means like one or two uh, major private actors really uh, play an exclusive role in terms of build and the service of the city. Uh, on the other hand, you also have strategic cities where the government try to crawl in the more capable uh, private actors. But in most cases, it's kind of fall into the category of mixed cities, meaning both the public sector and the private actor uh, develop land uh, that, that they interact uh, in the uh, city uh, area, uh, but in a not so coordinated, coordinated way. Uh, next, please. And then uh, we studied uh, the 14 cases uh, in uh, along three uh, major uh, areas. The first question, of, uh, the first topic we look at is what are the necessary conditions for privacy to me? The second question is, what are the functions that the significant private actors uh, took on? And lastly, uh, we think about and analyze how um, surpluses uh, of the cities are distributed. So now, uh, now let's uh, begin with uh, the first question. What's, what are the necessary conditions for the privacy to emerge? Um, the first uh, characteristic is that all those uh, private cities uh, emerge um, places that uh, what we call with relatively advantageous. Um, the first uh, one is that they are all um, very close uh, to major markets. Um, as you can see here, we listed the uh, nearest major agglomerations uh, close to the private cities. The median size of those agglomerations is about 15 million people. And the median distance between the private city and the major agglomeration is about 33 uh, kilometers, so it's very close. And secondly, the advantages uh, in terms of location is not static. Uh, in the book, we also discussed the dynamic aspect, the shocks. Sometimes the shocks just derive from urbanization trend, the rural urban transformation of the country. Uh, sometimes it's uh, due to uh, integration with the global economy, either in goods or in, in, or in services, other times because political uh, events. And finally, uh, technology uh, advances also uh, serves as shocks uh, to make some places um, more advantageous than before. Uh, next, please. And secondly, uh, consistent with the model assumption, uh, we indeed find that across all the uh, emerged private cities, uh, there were a weak or removed uh, local governments. And the majority of them, absolute uh, weak capacity uh, and reviewed by the, uh, uh, by, the, uh, by the situation. But in other cases, there's also deliberate neglect. For instance, uh, in the case of um, Jamashidpur, um, you know, where the Tata uh, a company, uh, Tata Group established uh, their city, um, it's located um, not close uh, to the south of Mumbai, where uh, the Tata group initially were. Instead, it's at the uh, uh, intersection of the colonial uh, government places and uh, the more traditional uh, landlord places, dominant places. So um, those are the places that are already have rich uh, mineral and uh, uh, mineral resources and connectivity, uh, but the colonial government deliberately are not developing it because uh, it's close to the um, landlords and subjected to more uncertainties. So um, that's kind of an example of uh, deliberate neglect and also shows, you know, when 
um, the industrial, the early uh, kind of industrialists of uh, India, they decided to develop place so how much they can do, uh, even in the backwater place. And in other cases, we also find proactive crowd in, like the strategic cities cases. These are most uh, um, you know, uh, visible East Asian cases uh, because in general, their local government is not as uh, you know, weak as in other parts of the developing world. Uh, but in comparison with the private sector, uh, they still uh, have a lot to catch up. For instance, in the case of Batam and uh, in the case of uh, Guam of China, uh, we will develop uh, the story uh, later. So in both cases, uh, the local government uh, deliberately tried to uh, you know, uh, form a contract uh, with the private sector um, to start the development of the city. Next, please. And third condition is, of course, the extraordinary private actors, as um, Martin repeatedly mentioned in the introduction. And uh, uh, we classify the extraordinary aspect of private sector in four uh, areas. So, um, in most cases, they have much higher capacity to implement at scale in terms of land assembly, uh, infrastructure development, um, urban planning, and providing services. In other cases, um, they adopt very innovative business models. Sometimes it's uh, really uh, fear the uh, economic uh, strategic uh, development orientation of the cities. In other cases, it's, it use uh, new technology. For instance, uh, you know, fire land, uh, filling the uh, uh, filling the sea, uh, and then build uh, land from the sea. In the case of Echo Atlantic. At the same time, there are also actors that not just one major developer or one uh, you know, private uh, industrialist, uh, rather uh, it's kind of collection uh, of uh, either private firms or, or, or uh, civil society. Uh, we also find a few cases. Um, and lastly, uh, some of those private actors uh, show ability to influence national level policies or public investment uh, in the favor of private. Next, please. Finally, we also found there has always been an institutional environment that enabled the, um, the development of the uh, private cities. I'll focus on the left side of the um, image uh, that shows uh, the government structure of Batam, Indonesia. As I mentioned, this is a typical case of crowd in. So basically, um, uh, the, the government side is the government of uh, Indonesia try to crowd in um, the um, industrial park development capacity of the Singaporean government linked companies. And so to enable uh, this, uh, uh, this crop in process to happen. So basically, uh, the government of uh, Indonesia set up a, a relatively uh, independent authority called Batam Industrial Development Authority, BIDA, at the bottom part of the chart. Uh, it reportedly somewhat to the Minsu government, but in more, more importantly, actually report directly initially to the president of Indonesia and later on to the board of SEZs rather than to the provincial and the municipal government. And then there is also a separation. There was also a clear separation between the functions of BIDA, the, the uh, development authority, and the municipal government. The development authority in charge of land allocation and uh, major infrastructure development, and the municipal government uh, take care of services provision. And then later on, the municipal government gradually uh, kind of uh, obtain more authorities and the function from BIDA as the city start to to grow and uh, become. Uh, more conventional city. So you see this uh, enable institutional environment that's beginning also the involvement of, of the institutional arrangement. Next, please. And then, as I mentioned, uh, the second topic we look at is what are the functions that the private actor uh, took upon? You know, uh, as traditional you know, urban uh, development uh, textbook will tell low government uh, should in charge of assemble a large chunk of land and also uh, improve uh, transportation um, transportation infrastructure to enhance connectivity and also um, decide the layout of the urban space and provide necessary services. We saw that uh, across the 14 cases, uh, most of the private developers indeed took upon some of those functions, but not all. 
the most common ones, of course, land uh, use planning and service delivery, uh, their performance is generally um, much higher uh, than the conventional cities counterpart. And also to our surprise, uh, we also find cases that the private actors deliver major transport infrastructure. Uh, if you recall the uh, first uh, cover page that Martin shows for the book, that's actually a metro line that developed by the DLF, uh, the private uh, real estate uh, real estate developer that are responsible for the growth emergence of the Gorgon city. And that's also the first private metro line uh, developed uh, in India. And uh, um, beyond the traditional functions, uh, what's most interesting is that we found many of the private actors also uh, take upon business development and also try to influence national level policies and investments in favor of the uh, private cities. Uh, next, please. In terms of business uh, uh, development, um, you know, one of the typical case is um, uh, the technology sector uh, picked uh, by the uh, uh, China uh, Fortune Land Development Company for Guan of China. Uh, so uh, different from other uh, private real estate developer in China. Uh, this uh, developer uh, take on a new industrial uh, cities approach. In their view, uh, if a city, especially a, a smaller local one, doesn't have economic orientation, they are uh, more typical to become, okay, to typical uh, become a bedroom town. So they uh, decided to, you know, uh, build a large, uh, over 3,000, uh, people uh, uh, kind of uh, t uh, team uh, to be in charge of uh, business uh, solicitation and to help uh, the locality to define about their business orientation. And this is outcome uh, techni uh, technology parks uh, focus on uh, uh, focus on uh, bio uh, uh, biochemistry and uh, 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 airspace uh, industries and are very successful in terms of uh, uh, pushing uh, the uh, economic growth quality. And the uh, last question, uh, next please, next please. Uh, the, the last question that we look at is how the surplus of the local localities uh, is uh, captured or, or uh, spread between different uh, stakeholders. The first, you need to um, meet the financial viability, meaning uh, the private actor should be able to recover costs. Secondly, in terms of political viability, is kind of consistent with uh, the model's um, conclusion that you need to have some parental uh, efficiency. Uh, all stakeholders need to benefit from urbanization. Otherwise, there may be uh, people against this idea. And we found that um, ta taxing the income of the locality is the uh, most common uh, instruments used by the government uh, to take back some of the surplus. Uh, that obtained by the private city or obtained by the private actor. And then the next one is uh, the selling the right to the city. Uh, next, please. Uh, next. Yeah, so when selling the rights to the city, two approaches are taken. One is really uh, just the uh, uh, licensing or selling the land concessions. And the second one is entering into joint ventures uh, with the private actor. Uh, for instance, in Guan's case, uh, the uh, local government entered a 50 year uh, PPP arrangement, and uh, the government compensated the private actor annually based on how many uh, private businesses have been attracted to the local. In the case of Fumi, uh, Fumi Home of uh, Vietnam, uh, almost a hundred year contract is formed when the government and private sector split the revenue. In those cases, the risks are higher for the government, the benefits are also higher. Uh, next, please. We also found that in some cases, the government was not directly involved and the surplus was shared with key stakeholders. For instance, in this case is that the private developer allowed the villagers to obtain their residential land within uh, the, uh, the, 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 the cities to be developed. And so when the land price of the surrounding parts, the more organized part increase, the land price of the village also increases. So the, um, you know, the villagers benefit from the overall uh, improvement of uh, income. Next, please. And finally, uh, there are cases that are court cases, litigations, and before the obligations that shift the uh, distribution of the surplus. Um, sorry, it took a little bit more time. And the um, final part, 
of the analysis. We also look at, next please, we also look at the non, um, uh, non-monetary aspect of the private cities. We found indeed um, there's not just up, uh, you know, up, up, upside of privacy, there are downsides uh, involved uh, white elephants, just as a, you know, a public uh, sector development, also environmental degradation, um, you know, uh, we show in the image that uh, when there is uncorrelated private development, uh, there could be a, a serious uh, environmental concerns and also increased disaster risks. But at the same time, we also find cases when greenery or environmental concern part of the value proposition, those cities uh, actually uh, perform better than conventional cities. Next, please. The next two concerns are also social segregation, and it could be within the cities, could be across uh, you know, between the private city versus the conventional cities, a uh, cream screaming uh, effect. Um, uh, but at the same time, again, the private cities, just as other dynamic city centers, create jobs, create upward mobility uh, for, uh, for both uh, low income and Labors as well. Uh, finally, there is institutional decision concerns. Um, you know, uh, there is uh, government issues because the private sector taken over the governance of the whole world area with growing uh, constituencies. Uh, let me stop here and uh, some other slides that we can discuss uh, in the discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you very, very much, UA and Martin for this very enlightening presentation. We will now have our first respondent to the paper, Rana Hassan. So Rana is regional lead economist for South Asia in the Asian Development Bank Economics and Development, Economic Research and Development Impact Department. Rana's research interests are extremely wide. They include industrial development, labor economics, urban economics, and poverty and inequality. He has previously served as director of the ADB's research department. This is when we met seven or so years, well, years ago. Rana has published in many journals and holds a PhD from the University of Maryland and a master's degree in economics from the Delhi School of Economics. Rana, this is for you. Thank you very much, Gilles. And uh, I, I hope my uh, slides are, um, are visible. Okay, so um, Gilles, first of all, thank you very much for uh, uh, you know inviting me to be uh, participating in this uh, uh, this excellent discussion. Um, uh, thoroughly enjoyed uh, uh, the, this uh, contribution by Martin and Yue and their colleagues. Uh, uh, I found it very unique, focusing on a type of urbanization that's um, taking place in the presence of weak local governments. Um, the set of case studies were fascinating. Uh, I uh, can't say I've gone through all 14, but the, the ones I read, I looked at uh, the Patam case, the East Dhaka, Eco Atlantic, Guan, Gurgaon, Sialkot, um, and, and, and very interesting um, uh, set of discussions um, and analysis on how these came up and, and the various interactions between uh, the two big players, the non government side and the government side. Uh, there's the analytical model. A uh, couple of observations here. Um, the 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 issue of uh, uh, the the socially optimal city size and surplus uh, that 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 comes up in in um, uh, you know one of the implications uh, is is this really a politically um, uh, can, can this be politically feasible in in, in many contexts? Uh, a, a second thought uh, that that came to mind is um, and and Martin put this very nicely. Uh, a lot of us are always thinking about raising local government capacity, but what's very interesting about their model is they 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 show that uh, at, it, it, in terms of the model that there are maybe certain threshold effects, um, that, and 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 if you're not going to be getting to that threshold local government capacity, maybe giving a bigger role to the private sector is is actually going to lead to better outcomes. And, and this is not the way uh, many of us actually think. So I, I thought that this was one of the most uh, interesting and intriguing uh, insights from the model. Uh, just very quickly, uh, the, the other big takeaway I took uh, uh, was really this importance of coordination uh, with the key players. You've got the government side and the non-government side, uh, whether it's a business association or an uh, individual business person. And, and I think really just in terms of where we go with this, uh, so the central challenge really is how do you achieve this uh, uh, coordination? And if I understood the model well, 
th this, this coordination is really central to maximizing the economic uh, surplus, and, and especially in a way that's inclusive. So UA was just telling us at the end about uh, all this segregation that also takes place, and then these environmental degradation. And I think here, at least my 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 impulse is you 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 do need that uh, coordination in the, the the public sector to come in. Uh, two quick thoughts, and 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 I'll, I'll end. One is uh, in 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 terms of uh, the 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 set of uh, criteria, the, the the set of things that Martin and UA put out there to be thinking about. Um, in, in maximizing the potential of, of, of these arrangements. One is the location potential. And here I wonder if certainly in a, con situa a context like India, where we are really seeing a lot of city regions emerging. So, so you've already got a city. Uh, here's the example of Indore, uh, right in the middle. It's a, a city in, it's somewhere in the center of central parts of India. And when you look at the city from the sky, you just see it actually just spreading and spreading. And it's uh, encompassing many different towns. It's a lot of villages over there. And so there's a potential for many private cities to emerge. Uh, and, and by the way, I should mention that these uh, charts uh, actually draw upon the spatial database that uh, UA and Martin put together. So many thanks to them uh, for that. Um, so, so this is where I think uh, the, the, the work that they've done is really highly relevant. Uh, and, and second and final point, um, this, this concept of the, um, uh, the this number of the cities that they look at, I was struck by this uh, economic development vision uh, by, by a particular actor. Uh, we see this in the case of Gurgaon for sure, as Martin mentioned early on, uh, but also the city of Guan and, and, and many others. And I think the, the, the key idea over here is that, uh, and I'm, I'm just going to quote them, for urbanization projects to be successful, uh, they had to attract private businesses. So in this view, a new city without a clear economic rationale would run the risk of becoming a bedroom town. So I, I think, uh, you know, coming to a point Martin made early on, which is one of the most important structural transformation is that of cities more than sectors. Uh, well, then, you know, this is this is really it. You, you, you need this city to be a really vibrant uh, um, uh, center for doing business. So, uh, you know, just to emphasize the importance of coordination in this context, this is some work we're doing in India. And, you know, when you just look at the, uh, the, the government ecosystem and you look at the different private sectors, whether it's industry association, the manufacturers, the services, the park developers, they're having to interact with uh, quite an elaborate government ecosystem, which spans not only local governments, but, but state governments, uh, provincial governments, probably in other uh, countries and contexts. And, and so uh, this coordination becomes really important. Um, I, I'm not going to go over these bottlenecks, but I think a, a central tool for, for overcoming this coordination problem is, 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 is something like formulating an economic vision for cities and, and trying to answer this question of what can my city be famous for. Um, this is not to be deterministic and pick winners, but there are sectors and activities that are much more likely to drive the local economy. Um, we know what these are today. What do we want to be known for about 10 years? And, and I think this is, this is a question which can actually bring the different stakeholders together. Uh, it can help think of what we need, what types of infrastructure, what kinds of skills, and, and 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 you can use that to identify some of these priority projects. You know, what are the critical infrastructure uh, things? The difficulty in this is, of course, how do you get this coordination taking place? Uh, this is something that I think a number of us are working on. Um, and 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 basically, the answer is obviously going to be very context specific. But but we do need to be thinking about these platforms for consulting across stakeholders and and coordination. Uh, I'll end there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rana. Uh, before moving to the Q&A after the next session, uh, people from the audience, please put your questions in you. Please put your questions forward. Uh, but before that, Bob Esler will respond. So Bob is the Governor, Professor of Cities, Business, Economics, and Public Policy at the University of British Columbia. So that's actually quite a mouthful. Uh, Bob earned his PhD in economics at Princeton University. For many years, Bob was a leading light in the, at the, in the area of urban and public economics. And in 2012, he became Dean of the Souther School of Business at UBC. And after 10 successful years in this leadership position, he is now back among us in the research trenches. And I'm really, really happy to see you back, Bob.
Thank you, Gilles. And good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, I'll just make a few comments. And um, let me start by uh, just uh, congratulating and commending Martin and you on a, a really nice uh, treatment of a very complicated set of issues. Um, just very quickly, I think the one of the things I was most impressed by was the, um, the detailed portrait of ubiquity and the diversity of private involvement in city formation in developing countries. You know, there's been some treatment of these issues in the literature, but certainly nothing that focuses, to the best of my knowledge, specifically on the challenges that would be faced uh, in developing countries. The series of case studies are fascinating. Uh, I did manage to read all 14, I'm proud to say, so I want some sort of a, a badge for that. Uh, and the analysis focuses on um, you know, the location of new private development relative to existing agglomerations and market access, the limited effectiveness of traditional governments, especially in the provision of infrastructure and public services, the ability and capacity of private actors and partners and the role of institu institutions and a supportive legal environment. Uh, the, art, the authors argue persuasively, I think, that policymakers uh, may have reasons to be concerned about differences in objectives and incentives between private actors in the public sector um, and differences, or, sorry, impacts on environmental quality, perhaps as a result of those differences in objectives and incentives. There's also uh, some concern about the sense in which um, private cities are fundamentally sorting individuals, which is a fairly common uh, aspect of the way land markets function. And that may lead to segregation and in increases in inequality. There's also a very interesting discussion on the impacts that they may have on political institutions. And of course, a lot of uh, concern about the distribution of land rents and the proceeds from, from development. Um, I wanted to say just a couple of things about the conceptual framework and then maybe make a few suggestions about things you could think about if you wanted to uh, continue to develop um, this, um, this, this literature. Um, so the, the, the conceptual framework here has a government, government and a developer who choose how much land to develop to maximize net output in the case of the government and profit in the case of the developer. Under particular assumptions about agglomeration economies, congestion, the effectiveness of public spending, and the costs of regulation. Uh, the authors characterize an efficient allocation and compare it to the levels that a local government and a private developer might choose. And they partition the parameter space into regions where particular types of private developments uh, might arise. Garden cities, strategic cities, and so on. Very interesting. Uh, the key result is that profit maximization and the exercise of market power lead to developments in the private case that are too small. And um, so I think the, the framework is interesting and I'll, I, I wanna make a couple of observations about that. Um, one of them, and, and I noted that Martin referenced uh, um, Joe Stiglitz in some of his earlier comments. Well, one of the things that Joe would always remind us of when we were all struggling in graduate school is that uh, governments can fail just as easily as markets. And so it's kind of an interesting um, comparison here. Uh, we have uh, you know, a challenged local public sector in various ways, maybe access to capital markets is an issue, uh, historic infrastructure levels are an issue. And I think the interest and interesting question is whether a private developer could, be, um, could outperform a challenged public sector I and mean, looking into that problem in more detail. I think could be um, kind of interesting. Uh, I was also struck when thinking about sort of the model and modeling in general here about just how diverse the circumstances of private development in these cities are. And it, you know, it's such a broad range of institutional detail that it's kind of hard to capture uh, in a framework. Um, and so I was trying to think for myself, sort of what are the canonical issues here that people would be concerned about? What are the sort of common, key common elements? And you've talked about a number of them. Uh, but the two that sort of came to, uh, to the front of my mind were um, circumstances where what the private development is intending to do is take advantage of a new commercial opportunity and generate employment growth. And the reason I think that's interesting is because the traditional public sector might well be interested in those outcomes. And secondly, um, the one that I think is more common um, 
and I think is probably present in almost all of the examples that you gave, is that there is some sort of a deficiency in infrastructure. Um, and I think, you know, all of us, when we've traveled in, um, you know, in, in Africa and Kenya and been to Mathari and Kamara and places like that, you know, one of the things you're just struck by is just how deficient infrastructure investment is. And uh, I see that as kind of one of the sort of primitive questions here. Would it be possible for a private development to in some sense be a second best policy toward the provision of infrastructure in a setting where traditional governments are constrained or challenged in various ways. Um, and maybe I'll come back to that in just a second. Uh, but in terms of sort of modeling questions and modeling choices, I would say the sort of biggest issue that sort of jumped out at me when I read through the, the manuscript is that there's no mobility in the model. You know, generally speaking, um, mobility of resources is the way that demand gets expressed in these sort of models of city formation. And, um, you know, migration would generally uh, lead to cities that are too large, especially in regions with substantial rural populations and low rural incomes. And it's that excessive migration and the degradation in sort of quality of life measures in cities as a result under congestion that creates a profit opportunity for the developer. And so it sort of creates the ability uh, that they may uh, acquire to profit by correcting some sort of an inefficiency in the urban system. Um, but mobility also tends, of course, to dissipate some of the benefits of infrastructure investment. If you're in a, um, you know, a framework where you have a number of cities in a system that are all occupied and you improve utility in one, that is resources sort of reallocate themselves to equalize payoffs, it's going to dissipate some of those, um, those rewards as well. And I think looking at the role of mobility here and migration uh, might be an interesting way to um, maybe make a little bit more specific some of the modeling that you've done. My sort of simple-minded approach here would be to think about, you know, suppose I wanted a model of the way private actors might help improve deficiencies in infrastructure. Um, what I might think about is you have a traditional public sector where they have made historic infrastructure investments, which are now depreciated and inappropriate relative to the scale of the system. You have the possibility of a new development nearby, which could correct at least for the occupants or the residents of a new development the level of infrastructure relative to other measures of economic activity. And you could imagine the private government uh, making an infrastructure choice, a public sector making, let's say a public service choice, but being saddled with inefficient infrastructure investments from the past. And then another stage in a game where firms or residents choose among locations to equalize uh, utilities. Uh, I think that could be kind of an interesting framework. It would be it wouldn't capture all of the diversity that you've so uh, so um, admirably described, but it might give you a, a few more specific insights into particular cases that could be of interest. Um, and again, I think one of the interesting issues here is whether or not private development can in some sense be a second best policy toward these kinds of problems. And uh, in particular, and the last thing I'll say is I think it would be really interesting to understand the circumstances under which the public sector would welcome private development. That is, under what circumstances is it welfare improving for the existing residents? I will stop my comments there and just say again how much I admired the work and uh, how much I enjoyed reading it. And thank you very much. OK, thank you very, very much, Bob. Uh, so we're now going to move to the, well, the Q&A. So let me actually start with a question for me. Uh, what I've learned from the report is really this wide heterogeneity of circumstances and roles that the private sector can play in the cities. Uh, so all of that, I think, suggests that things are going to be very context dependent. So future research, I think, will need to try to tease out what those context and dependencies and dependencies are, but more, prov more provocatively, you know, we're seeing that 
there are systematic well differences between private and public interventions, but the like public private interventions are, ne are, are never like really completely a slam dunk with success, nor the disaster that many were fearing. So does it mean that we cannot expect miracles and that essentially adding those private interventions is just one more tool that maybe we should be using more, but that's not going to be but that's not going to make a huge difference. So maybe maybe you should react to the two discussants and to me, and then we'll move to the or to the questions within the Q and A. Sure, happy happy to do that. Let, let me take a first uh, step, and uh, you may want to uh, add or amend. Uh, first, on on the first thing is a big thanks, and I'm really happy that uh, you enjoy the book, and also. Uh, happy that you challenge us on things that we are sort of aware of, but uh, certainly need attention. I think the, the, the points that Rana makes uh, on how to make this work, the kind of uh, contract, the kind of arrangement, uh, is something that we are seeing as one of the follow-ups to this research. In fact, what we did so far was analytically very static uh, and then uh, empirically just descriptive. Uh, but if one was to think so how to tap this potential to which also uh, Bob was referring, uh, what we see as a, as a huge problem is uh, is like the problems of PPPs on steroids uh, for several reasons. One is that the sunk investment is huge. So the temptation to default on the arrangement uh, can also be huge. So the, the private actor has to mobilize a significant amount of money that cannot be taken back. Uh, and even if you promise something today, you know that in developing countries, the next government may decide to renege on what you promised. Uh, but there is also the opposite uh, inconsistency, which is something we saw in the case of Burga, is that these places develop a, a constituency. So the private actor also knows that there will be someone making pressure. And in the case of Burga, uh, the private actors developed uh, the infrastructure and things like electricity, much less than was needed. Because, of course, the pressure of the population, the politicians to fix the problem will be huge. Uh, so you have this possibility of reneging on the, on the contract from both sides. And the way we're trying to think about it is more like, what will it take to create a market for major urbanization services? Uh, of course, it needs reputable actors uh, and it needs discipline in mechanisms, in addition of the usual problems of PPPs, which is how you handle a shock. That means that the, the, the expected uh, surplus is not what you anticipate at the time of the contract, how you renegotiate and all that. And we thought that that's the place where organizations like the ones UA, uh, I, Rana work in may also play a role because you may imagine that uh, if you build a market where it's a repeated gain, uh, defaulting become less attractive because you're out of the market. So you may get the kind of companies you got in Batam from Singapore or the kind of companies that you get in Cairo Festival City from Dubai, which or, or Siputra in the case of Indonesia, which may have an interest in being big players in that global market because the demand for urbanization is really huge. And you may have development lending and its consequences that you cannot default on, on a multilateral lender without the big consequences as an enforcement mechanism. So we were thinking in that direction, but we are afraid that the conditions under which these arrangements will arise, the circumstances to which Jill was referring to may be very decisive. On, on the major point uh, made by uh, by Bob about mobility, yeah, we're completely aware of, uh, of that weakness. In fact, we treated land as if the land attracts the capital and, and the labor uh, with it, and we didn't address the, the issues of, uh, of mobility. And we see that as uh, because of all the sorting that is involved uh, as uh, going, going from one jurisdiction and just assuming that capital and labor will come and, and fill the gap once the, the, the land is there, to multiple jurisdictions is, is the other dimension which uh, direction we wanted to go. My, uh, perhaps the only last thing before I turn back to you is that on, um, 
we see the cities as more than pieces of infrastructure. We see many circumstances in which the government commissions the big infrastructure to a private company and as a tender. But uh, but that's like one piece of the building block, the one building block of the city, and not this big vision to which Rana was uh, referring which is I will take advantage of this area that is underdeveloped because whatever laws on land conversion or, or whichever problems on land titling or uh, I can fix them. I have an airport, I have a highway uh, nearby already and I will take advantage of that and I will bring aerospace to a place that today is rural. You have to have a vision uh, for that. And I think it's more than the contracting out of big pieces of, um, of infrastructure. But let me stop there. Now, you maybe you pick up on other things or different takes? Uh, so maybe uh, some would overlap on the um, sectoral uh, orientation emphasized by Rana and also asked by one of the um, participants on whether it's a you know, necessary condition. Um, again, we didn't put it as necessary. Uh, we see again okay, across many of the cases, uh, there is this industrial orientation of, of entrepreneurial state type of uh, selection and uh, you know economic orientation but it's not always the case for instance one of the successful one i didn't emphasize i should is a fumi home uh it's basically just to provide uh, the necessary condition to attract both household and firms so emphasize both sides and then for the economic sector to emerge. It doesn't have a strong uh, sector orientation, but end up to be a very livable city and attract the firms as well. Uh, so also uh, kind of corresponding to um, you know, Bob's comment and Martin's comment, it's, it is a try to address the deficiency of infrastructure also in this case, but it's a deficiency uh, across sectors, not just transportation, not just uh, 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 let's say uh, water supply. It, it's really complex, and then you know, for city, uh, uh, the variety and the uh, integrated function of a city, and also again attract the both firms and households. Uh, let me stop here. Yeah, you, you, uh, if I may, Jill, uh, go to the questions in the Q and A or comments in the Q and A. Yes, please, because we're running over time. Yes. So we should um, take a look at the Q&A yeah, and same, they same. can choose the questions that well, they, attention. Well, let me, let me touch on, on them uh, very quickly. The, the question by uh, Vikas Chan Sharma. I completely agree. We, what we see is that an evolving uh, adaptative response by the government. We, we put the... UA did not comment on it, but the case of, uh, of Gurgaon, how you go from what was a village to changing the boundaries, creating a corporation, and we see it evolving. Most of the cities we studied end up being conventional cities. Sooner or later, that ability to adjust, and, and there are cases like Jambres who are still struggling in court not to become a conventional city. But we see that kind of institutional fluidity that is uh, very central to these things uh, working. Um, I'm not sure about the comment also by uh, Vikas Chancharma about sectors. I'm not sure. I will not go into saying, oh, it's industry rather than tourism that, that will make it. But I think it brings back, back the point by by Ran about the vision of what is the potential, the entire potential of a place. And sometimes the vision in the case of one, this was a company that had thousands of people studying sector by sector and bringing experts to help the transition, which is something we have not seen so much uh, when cities are developed by uh, uh, governments. Um, we have um, a comment by uh, an, an anonymous uh, attendee on how we define private actors. And I think the, the simple thing is to say it's not the local government, because in fact, in some cases, the private actor is not really private. When it's the government of Singapore, who is trying to handle the fact that uh, the city has become too expensive for its industrial parts. Uh, it's a public actor, but it's not the public actor that was expected to develop the, 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 the locality. That's what we meant. In some cases, they can be state-owned enterprises. Uh, so again, it's not strictly private. Let's read it as not being the local government you will have expected to uh, to take the lead. Ria Saimi asks, uh, do you think that the Indian government is keen to encourage uh, private affordable cities? My impression working there was that, yes, there was the idea of using the uh, golden 
quadrilateral of highways to, to innovate with arrangements. We saw it very clearly in the case of Indonesia that has a very interesting framework to encourage affordability. Uh, the, the case of uh, Kota Baru uh, Maja uh, is one in which uh, we see a lot of affordable housing because the government put in place a framework to really tap the, uh, the, the private uh, actors. And finally, uh, the point by uh, Akshay Nagar, I completely agree, it's not just the developing world. Uh, we gave the, the examples of, uh, of uh, Reston and uh, Tyson's Corner and Crystal City around uh, Washington, D.C. We give in the book another example that is quite remarkable outside Paris. You will not expect a dirigist government like the French government to be allowing these things to happen, but they end up happening. Uh, and, and we think our, perhaps touching on a point that uh, Bob was referring to, um, one can think of weak capacity in many ways. Weak capacity can be technically weak in developing countries, you have a lot of that, can be a coordination issue between uh, state uh, level ministries and agencies. Like when we studied Mitaka, there were 45 agencies in charge of the city and trying to coordinate among themselves. But the fact that the jurisdictions making decisions on uh, zoning and uh, land use are not optimal in size, which is what we see with all the movement of not in my backyard, maybe the big inefficiency that is coming up to urbanization or urban development is they are already urbanized, but uh, uh, urban development in, in uh, advanced economies. So we think that there is relevance for advanced economies too in this uh, in this way of thinking. And uh, the way that the big players, the Amazons and the Microsofts have been dealing with cities to try to see where is that they get the best deal uh, is an indication that this may become increasingly important. Thank you. Okay, thank you very, very much, Martin and Yue, for coming and presenting this work. Thank you also, Rana and Bob, for all those great comments. Now I'm going to turn it back to Ginny Birch to close the event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this really extraordinary session. Uh, you've done very original research. You've added a new dimension to our thinking about urban development, both in the developing and developed world. I know we will profit from all of this fine work. We hope to see more of you and hear about the next chapters in this kind of research. Thank you very much. Thank you all for uh, having us. Really enjoyed. And thank you for the great comments. Thank you.